Um, okay. okay. Video is now recording, and all right, and then you can click. Great. There we go. So now we've got all the information we need. Okay. All right. So here today we've got uh, the great Dan Finley and myself, Kenny Rowe. And what we are going to be doing today is a little experiment. It's kind of like a uh, micro podcast. Um, what we're doing is we've got a couple of things that we've come to this sort of meeting with prepared, but we didn't tell the other person what we wanted to talk about. In fact, we kind of encoded it in a way that was intentionally obfuscated such that we could, it only makes sense in, in context of, of a conversation or a story. And the impetus for this little uh, podcast, this microcast, is to invite the listener or invite the, the viewer to do this very same thing. So find another one or two people, after that it gets a little bit harder to do, where you can come together and share ideas together in back and forth conversation that's recorded that you can then, as you see fit, distribute to your community or to the wider internet, it really doesn't matter. But the point is there's no host, there's no guest, there's no podcast, but all of those things are still present and we're just going to have fun we're going to uh, see where the conversation goes. We're going to really listen to each other and see if there's something that we can both add to each other's thoughts. So that's the idea, Dan. Sound, sound like a plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a plan. It's been a, been a while since we got to catch up. So uh, yeah, yeah so I, I feel like there's a million fun things to talk about. Yeah. Okay, so I came up with two things. Dan came with two things. I'm going to uh, share my first thing and then we'll, we'll uh, We'll talk about it. So my uh, first agenda item is called second quarter free throws. What does that mean? Okay. All right. So when I was growing up, um, I was a big basketball fan. I was a fan of the Portland Trailblazers because they were awesome, Rip City. And I remember my mom often telling me, or or having she had was would have this critique of of basketball, and it was like she couldn't understand why there was so much emphasis and importance given to the fourth quarter to Clyde Drexler with the ball on the three point line, banking it in to win the game. Like she couldn't understand mm -hmm. that or because she thought in her mind, all of the subsequent scoring and points that had come before it were just as consequential and literally counted for the same amount of points. Mm -hmm. right? um, so she would say something like, well, what about the second quarter free throws? Don't they matter? And I was thinking about this idea, uh, this of uh, why do the points in the fourth quarter mean so much more than the points in the second quarter when they actually count for the same amount of points? And then I thought, well, it's because the game is ending. You know mm -hmm. when the game is ending. And it has a larger impact on the result of, of the game because everything that happens at the end for more or less determines the final outcome. And you can't really go back there's nothing you can do to go back and change the second quarter, so to speak. And, and I think this is really indicative of the kind of game basketball is. There's a beginning and a middle and an end. These are sometimes just called finite games. Mm -hmm. But my mom was thinking in a different frame of reference. She was looking at a finite game and thinking, why are any one of those things more important than the other? which makes a whole lot more sense in, in way of thinking about it if the game were to continue. If the game never, never stopped, or even if it just paused, but just continued to play and you just keep running up the score, then yeah, the, all of the points would generally be about the same. And at, and at a point you could say, at any given time, almost anything can change the course of the game or the feeling of the game, or even the rules of the game, which might be significant, but you don't know when that's going to happen because the game isn't bounded in the same way. It's an infinite game. And so a lot of, uh, I think our friends probably are familiar with this. There's a book out um, called Infinite and Finite Games, which talks about some of the dynamics between these two kinds of games, infinite and finite. The infinite game is where the game is to continue play. It's not to win. It's not to like finally beat the other guy. Though there can be those games in there mixed in. It's a different way of thinking about the world. And I was thinking to myself, like back when I was a kid watching the, the Trailblazers on TV, you know, my mom had this intuition even then before having the sort of mental framework about what finite and infinite games are. Um, so that, that's my story. And, uh, and I'll turn it over mm -hmm. to you, 
can to, to maybe reflect on some of those, those ideas of infinite and finite games and when things mean, when things are important in the course of those games. Sure. So at first I, I was thinking of the answer being like very, very obvious and like exactly what you said, which is basically, look, if there's, if there's two minutes left in the game, then every three seconds with the game, you know, that's it's like a considerable fraction left. Right. And that's, that's the time that's left to swing the score. And um, so each of those points is, is more consequential towards the final. But then I, then I realized that actually uh, that is only suspenseful in games where it's close in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. So like maybe actually those second quarter ones were really valuable and important. And uh, uh, you know, it just seems uh, more urgent at the end because well, you don't have as much opportunity to compensate for any deficit. So, you know, you can do like a random walk from any score and you can say like, well, we've got a chance to come up, but it's a diminishing chance. The wider the time, the wider the score difference and the shorter the time. And uh, so, so maybe it actually, it is. And uh, it, it's just, it's just psychology kind of playing into us. Um, but, but I agree. There's like um, very different strategies you have to take in finite games. Like sometimes there's a deadline. And, you know, there's some event that's coming that dramatically changes how you have to think about how you're going about something. Um, I know, you know, as, as a developer in an ecosystem, a lot of times you might know somebody else is aiming for a point in time. And so you, you end up trying to coordinate milestones, for example. So sometimes this is just a coordination thing. But um, I know, like, every time I play a new board game, like the hardest thing for me about like some of these like, you know, kind of advanced, you know, what they say like Euro style games will always be like pacing the strategy. Cause it's like, cause you know, I, I might be the farmer and I might just like till the first seven rounds, but, and, and, you know, I may have the absolute most fertile soil at the end of the game, but it turns out it was a 10 round game. And so if you didn't start uh, planting seeds and harvesting, like you're not going to get on the board. Uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think, Kind of, it just has to do with knowing what kind of game you're playing. Now, basketball, you're not, you don't have those multiple phases. So I almost kind of, I think after all of that, side with her a little bit where it's like, those are always important. It's just kind of psychology that makes us feel otherwise. Like, like it doesn't feel as bad when they score against you early because you know you've got longer to make up for it. And, it. and we are probably selecting for close games when we say that it matters a lot at the end. And what do you think is happening with information in a game when you're in a finite game, when you're approaching the end? Uh, with information? I mean, it depends what kind of information sharing game, I guess. Um, like, so if we're taking basketball, like, we know, we know the time. That's the obviously public information, the time and the score. Um, and so we know that uh, there is a diminishing opportunity to turn it around. And so, uh, so yeah, I think the urgency cranks up. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll phrase that a slightly different. So... You had mentioned earlier there that you know you can you could take like how many seconds are there in the last two minutes and maybe some general prior information about the probability of scoring X amount of points in such minutes, right? So mm -hmm. the information coming up closer to the deadline seems to get different than than in the beginning, or at least um, it tends to converge on something that's higher higher with higher probability. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess the amount of time remaining is like the that's like the open ended potential of the game, right? And uh yeah. So yeah, we're like tending toward we're converging towards a known and, you know, uh, an irreversible outcome. Right. Um, and when there are let's say two to three possibilities which are potentially equally likely is when we would experience suspense. Right. And if it's yeah. a high probability, so you could even quantify that information in some way back to the psychology. Right, so there's some at least idea about uh, the, in, the the probability or the information that's in the game affecting the emotions of the players. Yeah, yeah, I bet you could totally model it with probability. You're just saying like the suspense is equal to like the probability that messing up right now is going to lose you the game versus doing the right thing is going to win it. Mm -hmm. And and earlier on the game, there's just yeah, there's just lower probability that these are the decisive moments. And then maybe turning that to, to something more infinite where, where it's always open-ended, meaning uh, we're not converging on a probability, but there's still high emotions involved in infinite games, right? Yeah. Well, I think then when you want to evaluate probabilities on 
uh, an infinite timeline, you just have to pick timelines to measure them. Because like you, you can't say what are the odds that we, well, I guess you could say that we eventually die, but you never get to measure it, right? So it's like any prediction mark, you have to pick a deadline. You're gonna have to say when you're counting to. Um, otherwise, it's like the question ends up being meaningless. Or from a different perspective, meaning your emotional response is to something that has already happened. Uh, uh, yeah. by me again. Right, so my hypothesis here in infinite games are more emotionally charged by their direction than by their outcomes, because there is no necessary oh, sure. outcome. But the, sure. the game can change quite radically and quickly, but, but usually either those, those, you know, just sort of changes, and then your, your reflection upon that change gives that emotional stimulus, or possibly while you're there in the moment, it's very acute, but not necessarily predictable. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's a good way of putting it, like, like you can only extrapolate. If you've got a really, really long timeline, you just want to see improvement or progress towards like a uh, desirable outcome. Like if you've got all the time in the world, it's, it's less meaningful that you get it done really fast. It's more meaningful that you're like tending towards success. Or, uh, or that you feel that you have uh, some level of consistency, at least emotionally, I would assume that that's important. And that when we mm -hmm. experience uh, large changes in direction, that, that can be explain some of the angst or emotion you might feel in an infinite game, even if the game is still continuing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, w what you're saying is reminding me a little bit about how uh, I, I sometimes think about like how corporations do like quarter by quarter accounting, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you are accounting on a short term, there's like a higher urgency to do whatever it takes to report profits immediately. Yeah. So, you do the Mick Romney thing where you can just, you can fire everybody and look at the savings. It's basically, you're in the black. Like you're, you're definitely making money when you're selling all your office equipment. Nice. Um, but if you just extra, if you extend the deadline of the game a little bit, suddenly you're like, oh, actually that, that was awful for us. That was, this was clearly gutting the, the organization. Um, and, uh, and, and the same thing goes for interest rates, right? Like basically the higher the interest rate on, if you're taking out a loan on your small business, it sets the pace for your success. Like how, what is the, what is the velocity of revenue that you're returning? Uh, and it, it is absolutely equal to, it's, a, it's equal to the interest rate plus your, the cost of your survival basically. Mm -hmm. um, which is definitely why, I, a great example of why I care a lot about getting people access to low cost of capital, uh, you know, lending. And, and to me that tends to, it, I usually tend towards uh, looking at like peer to peer lending schemes when I'm thinking about that, but I don't want to dive straight into why I think that necessary. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Anything interesting other than uh, kind of what we've covered so far and sort of my infinite and finite stories? Uh, uh, I mean, do we, do we have any infinite games? <laughs> uh, do we? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. So I think, um, I, well, I also do think it's a, it is a matter of perspective and you can kind of mm -hmm. flip it back and forth between wanting to continue to play or just play something and, and, and wanting to win something or accumulate or to have finality. I, mm -hmm. I, I actually do think it's not, it's not either or, but it is, it is a frame of mind and a frame of reference because it absolutely will color your decisions. So people who tend to think longer term and or um, aren't necessarily, so you might not think of like your career as an infinite game, but you might think of working as an infinite game. <laughs> so you can, you can always be working even if it's digging a ditch and filling it back in. It's just a choice. Mm -hmm. um, but you could have many different types of jobs or anything like that. Uh, but it, it's good to be aware that these things sort of exist and that they have different consequences. You know? Like yeah. when we're thinking about, um, especially if we're thinking about the games that we're playing more consciously, I think we might be able to, you know, steer them in maybe slightly better outcomes. So like when you were saying, you know, if you're, if you're interested in outcomes, well, maybe one of our outcomes is to continue to survive as, mm -hmm. as a species. Well, what are those, what are the games that might end up making that more possible? Right, and we have to kind of decide for ourselves what uh, what survival looks like. Um, yeah, there's a whole different. Or, you could define it in many different ways. Certainly. Yeah, many many ways. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, someone can define it for you. They can say like, well, I think you need a small cage and some water and occasional, you know. And that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, it can it can work. <laughs> you can you can have a real infinite game like that. Uh, but uh, but yeah yeah when when we're like defining our own strategies yeah we I guess end up we're blessed with it we're cursed with the uh, ability to decide our own goals. Uh, or, you know, some people uh, think we maybe don't, maybe we, we get them, maybe we inherit them from our culture or religion or, or whatever. I, I tend to be on the, we, uh, we can create meaning wherever we want it uh, side of the camp myself. Cool. All right. Over to you, your turn. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure I fully understood the, the premise of the uh, cognitively encrypted. I think my, my prompts were less, less cryptic or abstract uh, than yours. Uh, they, they tend to have a slightly more uh, like what was on my mind at the time bent. Um, sure. Uh, I mean, honestly, there, there were like, there were bits where I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, projects that, you know, you've been talking a lot about online. Um, sure. and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, a little, little bit torn. Um, yeah, do you mind if we just like talk, talk about uh, like, like what I would call, because because I think that I've seen you talk about Urbit mm -hmm. in terms of it being uh, built with like a, like like a, like Linux is like Legos and this is like a, a Mandelbrot uh, set or equation, yeah. you know, fractal, beautiful thing. And uh, yeah. when you when you use language like that, I mean, it reminds me of a lot of my favorite architecture. I I tend to think the most beautiful architectures resemble the dynamism of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that there's good reasons that we see things in nature. It's because these things, they scale and grow and sustain themselves. And um, so anyway, so when I hear you use language like that, it makes me curious. Uh, but of course, Urbit is like a, uh, a almost famously uh, opaque. Yeah, yeah. 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 People have no idea what the hell they're looking at. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I do have like a an Urbit Moon or something. Uh, from <laughs> um, okay, but uh, but yeah, I, I totally don't get it. I have not put in the time to learn its uh, its unusual languages or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So maybe you could give me a peek at like what okay. you think about it. Is uh, and and also I'm just going to add before like there's also a caveat that like I I, I also have an eyebrow raised because I heard people like saying that uh, it it encodes the ideology of its founder or something who's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so so I, I'm kind of curious about uh, its shape and, and the kind of nature that it encodes and, and all that. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm happy. Let's let's just go ahead and do that. Um, so the the tweet that you were mentioning, and I, and I think it's a particularly um, illustrative tweet to where to, to where I was thinking it and where what I how I think about Urbit currently. So mm -hmm. the the tweet was um, Linux, meaning the most widely used operating system on the planet by far runs the internet and most of the Fortune 500 companies, all of Silicon Valley. Let's just kind of call that what Linux, that's what Linux is, which is yeah. an amazing story. Yeah. And, and that, 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 that power and the flexibility and the deployment that we see from that software stack is like someone looking at nature, like a tree, noticing the fractal patterns and then building those fractal patterns meticulously crafting them over billions of human hours with Lego blocks. And what they build is beautiful. It really is. And it has the same somewhat similar structures that it has. Maybe it's not quite as smooth and, you know, regular. It's a bit coarser, that kind of thing, but it works. It works fantastically well for what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then Urbit would be something like discovering the Mandelbrot set. So the Mandelbrot set is essentially you know, it's a set of points that describe a mathematical function that does the same thing, that creates fractal patterns. Now, you're not going to get a tree from the Mandelbrot set, but you get something very beautiful. And it is very geometric in the sense of it's perfect. It's, math, it's a math, pure mathematical function, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm, what I'm getting at here is um, one of the critiques about Urbit is that you got 25 guys in a little office in, in San Francisco. How are you going to compete with the giantness that is Linux and Unix? Well, it's like that. Mm -hmm. so they're going to compete by working smarter, not harder. And okay, well, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Well, 
so in the beginning, um, you know, the, the internet was sort of envisioned to be this sort of peer to peer place where everybody was going to be running servers. You were going to host your own email. You know, that's the way the world was going to be. We're going to share resources and we're going to connect like that. But it turns out Linux is actually really hard to use and you kind of have to have a lot of special knowledge and information to do that. And so the people that could tended to centralize around these large companies and provided services built on Linux administration for the most part. I mean, mm -hmm. not including Windows, but it kind of ended up being similar in that case anyway, just sure. because of the way Windows is. And that's why we have a client server architecture on the internet today. Not because it was sort of meant to be that way or that it was even hard to do it. It was hard to run Linux, right? Okay, so if you could attack that problem, make it not hard to run Linux. So, I mean, you could reform the internet by trying to attack Linux. We can make a new distro of Linux. But there's not really anything you're going to do about that 50 million lines of code in the kernel. And every single time you need to add some new, new hardware, a new input device or anything. It has to be like, you know, compiled into it. Hmm. It was never meant to be a networked architecture. Like it was just a bunch of stuff that it really wasn't designed to do that we use computers to do today. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, you go back to the drawing board. You're just like, all right, what is a computer, right? What are those functions that make computation happen? Well, it turns out, you know, we have a lot of, we, we know a lot about this. We know a lot about how to make a computer from very abstract, fundamental axiomatic principles, right? So if you give me enough axioms, I can build you a computer, a Turing complete machine. And that's mm -hmm. what Urbit did. The core uh, base of Urbit, it fits on a t-shirt. You know, it's not 50 million lines of code. Mm -hmm. um, and with that core, you, you strip away all of the, the, the legacy baggage that comes along with it. So you can just move faster, you can do different things. And it was designed to the way we use computers today. And that was that that seems like okay you could do it do it that way but there was also one other interesting little quirk about the, uh, the base kernel is that it uses a, a kelvin versioning system and a kelvin versioning system goes down not up so hmm. when um when this was first invented in 20 you know 2003 which was a long time ago and you know our our business hmm. uh, started out with like roughly a thousand degrees and right now it's at like four four degrees above absolute zero what is, well, what does that mean? It's meant to stay the same. It's not meant to change. Hmm. Like that opens up a whole new way of using computers because if that core base is static and with um, predefined APIs into it, it's sort of hermetically sealed from its outlying architecture. And it's just mm -hmm. a function anyway. So it's just, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a specification in a core. It's not actually in silicon and it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not living on top of any, it, it's, it's kind of its own thing. So it's also mobile in that sense, which is actually kind of nice. So you've got this really core base that doesn't really change. It has uh, basic ways of interacting with it, which is, let's just call it also sort of like a static API. And then you get all your functional, functionality to the outside world with interpreters. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I got an interpreter and I wanna add virtual reality to my, to my interface. Well, then I, I write the interpreter to, in, to get into the, the CPU, let's call it. This is called NOC. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will return out, and then I can do my, my computing that way. Um, and it's the way, there's some other technical details that are fascinating to get into, like the, the core data type is just an integer, an unsigned integer, so an atom. Mm -hmm. And then the next layer up is a, a noun, which is a pair. Of, of atoms mm -hmm. of unsigned integers and you can nest those as many as you want right so you could have um, two nouns make a noun two <clears throat> atoms make a noun <clears throat> and that gives you a binary tree structure right. right so you can always define where you're at and what item of information you're trying to get at which is which is helpful in the in that it doesn't i mean it's a kind of registry but it's not the same as like a, a buffer right it's a, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a tree structure with with a formula so whatever if you're if you're looking at the subject, which is like the, the leftmost thing, that's like mm -hmm. you know the, the the first the whole bit is one, and then the head of that is two, and then the the, the tail of that thing is n plus one, and then you multiply mm -hmm. that by two, 
and that brings you down to the next tree structure so you can always find out where you are. <laughs> and, and it's things like this that can get built up over time from very core base pure principles such that we get to a virtual machine that's sort of network native to begin with. It's much cleaner in a, a functional sense because it's using functional and notions of computation as sort of imperative functions or imperative mm -hmm. styles. So you're not moving variables around and modifying their state. Uh, an urbit function has no internal state. Hmm. You put something in and you get something out, right? All bases are covered. Hmm. Um, and you get a lot of stuff sort of for free when you, when you build uh, a system like this, right? So it's, it's, it's an analogous to taking the core models of computation, virtualizing them and it's sticking them into a network infrastructure so that we could get back to what it is that we thought we were going to do in the 80s and early 90s with the internet. So that's a bit long-winded and there's some other things that you probably have heard of like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of names in Urbit because things are similar to the existing structure but not quite they were given sort of names esoteric names right to differentiate them while they're being built so for example, in our current network structure of the internet, we have DNS root nodes, the domain name services, right? Mm -hmm. There's 13 of those. Really? That doesn't seem like very much. Well, it's worked so mm -hmm. far, right? Mm -hmm. And in Urbit, those are called galaxies. They're like DNS root nodes, but there's 256 of them. Why is there mm -hmm. 256? Because we're computer scientists and we like powers of two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. it's an arbitrary number. It's more than 13. And then you can just follow that pattern and it gets you to something like if you have a three layer networking structure, which is basically used for peer discovery. Cause once you got, once you know where your peer is, then you just go peer to peer. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a three layer system starting at 256, and then each one of those nodes can create 256 and each one of those can create 65,300 or 536. Now you have an address space of about 4.2 billion wow, that's going to that's gonna hold us for quite a long time. And you can think about what the, the scarcity of that address space might do in our network now, because now we can address things like um, spam and denial of service attacks, because they're tied to specific names with reputation. And, you, and there's a real cost to getting a, a new one. So we sort of eliminate some of those other problems at the beginning of the early internet too, while not well, uh, still giving us peer discovery and sort of a hierarchy that makes the, the network work. Okay, I, I think that's where it, that, that was the first time, the first part of your whole description that uh, set me, uh, you know, like t t ticked my, uh, like, uh, your spidey sense. Know, my spidey sense. Yeah, yeah, like, like the, the selling of namespace as a security mechanism, like, it's a, uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's very, common and popular and uh then you know we've we've uh, considered you know like maybe we sell like a little namespace ourselves you know because people love usernames and things mm -hmm. um but i've been i've been approaching this from a kind of different perspective and i think there's like a really strong case to be made uh basically borrowing from object capability security where you just say oh you want to spam me well you basically if we initially say your address is a secret for example, like, mm -hmm. so the kind of the way we said we would do with this video at first, like we would each have it and then we can share it as we like, right? Um, no one can, regardless of having not bought a name for this video, um, no one gets it until one of us shares it, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something elegant and perfectly natural about that kind of uh, arrangement and phenomenon. We're each just kind of trusting each other to, to do well by it. Um, as soon as you have like a global registry, well, at least people know your your address and um, and uh, you know so they, at the very least I, I don't know if they can send pings to that or what but there's there's a global address space they're, they're looking up um, hopefully you know there's no permissions leaking um, but if there's if there's address lookup but there's not permission leakage I guess I would just ask why not just go that one extra step why not not leak uh, addresses in the first place um, so okay okay why not have addresses known? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I used a double negative. Uh, yeah, let me let me try to phrase that in a positive uh, way. Um, 
So, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about how the security isolation between these uh, stars works, but I, I assume that you have authority of your own star and no yeah. one can run code on it without your permission. Right. Um, and uh, so if that's the case, then what is the namespace protecting? Um, it w would be one initial like probing question, I guess. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily protecting anything, but it is, um, so because your name is known, but your location is not. It changes frequently, mm -hmm. actually, uh, unless it's static, which, you know, a galaxy and orbit are static. They, their addresses don't change, their IP addresses specifically. Mm. Okay. Um, but if I used to know your, your IP address is, and now my orbit is trying to talk to your orbit, but it's, yours has changed, I need some way to figure out what that is, yeah. what, what it is now. And when mm -hmm. you announce yourself to the network, you announce what your IP address is is like to your star, right? Okay. So it always knows who you are. And you can ask, hey, do you, do, I could ask my star, do, do you know where Dan is? And it'll, it'll be like, yep, there you go. It'll forward the first um, packet. And then that's, that's, then we can go peer to peer from there. Or if it doesn't know, it has to go all the way up to the top, to the galaxy. And it, and so your, let's say my galaxy all the way up and yours is, are different then those two are always connected at the, at the very top. And then they end up down after that. Does this imply that a star or a galaxy can, could censor your ability to look, look me up? Yes, it can. And, and the way you can get rid of that, or more likely is, I mean, censoring would definitely be something to guard against. But, but the, the, use, the thing that we see now is just delinquency. People just don't keep their stars online. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Far more common because it's an early network and there's just not, you know, as much um, incentive to do so. Yeah. So you can, um, you, can, you can escape from any star at any time. And that's, that's actually an Ethereum transaction. So the, um, the keys that, that allow you to start your, your orbit, that's, mm -hmm. that's on a smart contract called Azimuth on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And then you can also issue the, the uh, command escape now you're free and now you can um, any other star calls the function adopt and your number and now now you're paired together okay so it uses ethereum as a kind of like introducer discovery yeah okay and when you boot it checks the th that your it checks your keys when you when you boot up right right okay because yeah i'm kind of comparing it in my mind to things like scuttlebutt or um I mean, Scuttlebutt's a really good example of this. Or um, yeah, what's yeah, the yeah, open? Yeah. What, what's the one that, uh, that that like Twitter alternative Mastodon is built on Activity Pub and all that? Mm -hmm. um, I think the way those work, and and it's a very there's a very strong parallel where like um, when I'm posting or, or when somebody wants to discover me, they would go to what they call a pub, what you're calling either a galaxy or or yes. what's between a star and a galaxy source. Um, no, that's Maybe. it. I mean, there's three no, levels, okay. but it's very much okay. like a you know, well, in, a, in the, the scuttlebutt version, the pubs are just like you had no second layer. It's just two layers deep, right? right. And, and in that sense, you're more dependent on that layer. Or except that layer. you can subscribe, you can subscribe to multiple pubs though. So you can just, you can simultaneously subscribe to like three or four pubs or, you know, any number really. And so if any, if all but one of them goes down, you can still find each other. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, no, it's very similar. It's very similar, actually, to that. Just, you know, two levels instead of one and one subscription instead of multiple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And different yeah, trade-offs, so, too, right? Because you're going to get different right. levels of performance. And in, in Scuttlebutt, you don't really have much idea. Like, Dominic is very clear about the identity slash reputation stuff is all handled by users. It's, there's nothing in the protocol that's going to do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually kind of like that about it. Um, you know, because what, what you do is, because uh, each user, you could say a user kind of serves as, as a pub too. So like if Twitter were on, um, uh, were on SSB, uh, I'm, I'm replicating your posts because we're friends. Right. But when I block you, that means I stop replicating your posts. So people who are, maybe they don't have a pub in common with you, they kind of stop seeing your, your posts. So yeah. In, in the SSB community, they've like taken on a bit of a like cultural um, apprehension about that. They're like, blocking is the last thing you do. They're like, cause it's, it's so final, you know, you don't, 
you're, you're depriving that person of voice. Um, uh, I, I tend to be a pretty pro Twitter blocks personally. I, I think, <laughs> I think you have a, I think we have to protect our like, uh, mental like safety and like, yeah, there's just a, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of abuse out there. Um, and, and you open yourself up to, to, you know, I, I don't want to use the word rando cause it's so cruel, but if, if somebody comes in with a new account and they're just being abusive and, and they're not really taking uh, the humanity and, and emotions of others into account. Uh, I, I don't. I don't see any uh, reason to not cut them out. I think I'm. I think I'm way more uh, dispassionate about that than than the SSB norm uh, is right now. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would tend to agree. And but not that I don't. I. I mean, I love SSB. I love secure scuttlebot. It, it's it's cool. In fact, I even want to try to, one of my first ideas with Urbit was to try to make a scuttlebutt or a gossip protocol very similar mm. inside of Urbit so that you can maybe mix and match some of these things. So what's the, uh, what's the reputation uh, system on, on Urbit? Uh, well, I, I, rep, yeah. Yeah. I like to chew apart the reputation systems. I, so <laughs> there is, there is no, there's no built in reputation, meaning there are no oh, points, okay. there's no anything like that. There's a reputation primitive. I mean, hmm. there is there is such thing as identity, and that's it. So what is what is the uh, I, the thing called identity? Uh, your name. Consistent? So Just this, your name. this this is me. Oh, okay. Oh, is that your symbol? Is that generated yeah. procedurally from your name? It's deterministic. It's a deterministic. Um, like, do they have readers for it? Can can I? Yeah, can almost, I scan that? almost, almost. Oh, that's that's very cool. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of procedurally generated deterministic artwork. Um, so that's what this is. And, but my name is human readable, human sayable, but it's not human meaningful to, right. unless you assign meaning to it. So I can say it, sick dev pilln up. Yeah. That's not a word, but I memorized it. And that's like, you know, four, three and a half billion, I think is the number that, that it corresponds with that. So I would right, never right, be able yeah. to really num memorize that, that address. But I mean, that's what mm -hmm. my address is. And then I stick all of this meaning onto this name, but I have many other names that I can use at this point anyway. So if I need to, you know, um, if I need to be pseudonymous, I can be pseudonymous or, or not, or mm -hmm. if, if I need to, um, I can create sub identities. So they're longer, right? So this one is, mm -hmm. is sick dev is six digits. And so is pill nut. Well, if I double that, then that's going to be a sub address. Right? So it's going to be harder to say. It's going to be clearly identifiable as a sub-identity. But then let's say you might, as a developer, decide to treat those in certain aspects or just different ways. So in Urbit, you don't have to own a planet in order to participate. You can, you can mine what's called a comet. And a comet just mm -hmm. needs a little bit of proof of work to, to provide mm -hmm. against spam. And then you've got a giant, giant name that's huge, huge, huge. And everybody knows immediately that it's a, this free-floating identity. Huh. Right? So okay. you choose how you want to identify with that. So right now, in the chat forums that are live on Urbit, comets come and go, and people don't ignore them. People don't ban them. They're, they're first-class citizens. But I can easily see, let's say, if we wanted to create our own subset of, of a community on Urbit, we might not allow um, comments. Right. And that would be a way in which we assign identity or reputation just collectively. We, we decide what to do. So you can, you can, there's a, there's a couple things you can put your identity framework on, but that's it. You, you, you're, you have mm -hmm. to actually do that. But there's some, there's some kind of colloquial notions about what that might mean. So they're harder to say, they're bigger to say. So that's like, let's, that adds cognitive sort of you know, weight to their names, that that has some sort of, that, I mean, that in and of itself is sort of, I mean, it's not explicit, but it is like at least cognitive. Like, you know, like, oh, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, maybe I'll just stick with what I know, you know? Now, okay, so let's say I make a comment and let's say we both make comments and we, we just want to, we want to spin up a, a, you know, hangout zone or, you know, a little program that we share together. Um, we, do we depend on someone with a galaxy or star to be able to interact at all over this protocol? Uh, you, you depend on those, not necessarily a galaxy, but for, uh, 
any two, if they're not in the same, if you don't know where to go, then yes. In, in terms of peer discovery, you need to find out what the IP is. Sure. Is. So if we have each other's IP, if, if we can, we kind of just spin up our own like little unassociated star. Um, well, you can always spin up your own unassociated network, hmm. right? So in that sense, just like the whole namespace and everything, everything. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it would use the same namespaces, but you could use the same names because they're not on the same network. Hmm. Like when you do, when you work with Urbit as a developer, you boot into something. Uh, so the root, the root is the root node zero node is called Zod. And, and when you're a developer, you boot fake Zod, which means it's like a local thing. Right, right. And you can do whatever you want. Those can still interact with the main network, though, potentially? No, no. no. Okay. They, they've got to interact. They can interact um, on any of its own, like on your local network, it'll work. Just like, right. it'll just work because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then once you jump out, then there you're going to have to have some means of coordination between you on your own network. Which could okay. be arbitrary, but you're right, going to right. like either build your own pubs, in which case you're, you know, you could do that. But right, right. Yeah, I guess I guess that kind of reveals a little bit. Just uh, yeah, and we should probably move on because we just spent we had way too long. I'm sorry for going no, into no, a topic no, no. that you. It's it's so interesting to me, and you uh, you know have a, have a lot of knowledge and, and uh, passion for it. Um, but yeah, that does I think reveal to me a little bit of one thing that. It makes me a little apprehensive the notion that there is kind of permanently scarce uh, availability or access to the network. Like the fact that if you want to interact with the existing ones, you need access to one of the stars. And now, you know, 256 times 256, I, presumably it won't be too hard to get access. But I, I dream of a future that is a little bit more permissionlessly uh, joinable uh, and extensible. Um, uh, you know, and uh, anyway, so. You know, assuming assuming of those two fifty six that somebody's not a jerk, it's probably fine, and that's probably a fine assumption. But uh, yeah, I, I love uh, eliminating assumptions when I can, and uh, you know, especially when one thing I've been thinking a lot about is like spontaneously scaling a little bit. Like, let's say we've got uh, some tokens on the blockchain, but we're gonna go to we're gonna go camping, or we're going to Burning Man, or or we're gonna we're going to a disaster zone, and we want to account for our supplies and, and help make sure they're getting deployed appropriately. Uh, we may want a way to spontaneously break off a portion of the network in a, in a form that's more offline capable. And, and you know, we, we may not, uh, yeah, yeah, who, who knows, maybe one of the galaxies doesn't approve, or, or maybe it's just that we want to be able to operate well offline. And so I, I like the idea of networks that can, uh, you know, dynamically break apart and heal again. And uh, yeah, a anyway, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, you could you could totally do that. You could even use the same keys. Yeah, right. Nice, cool, cool. Um, but, but it yeah, would so be a separate machine, right? Like it's different. right, right. It doesn't oh, share right, right, because it's in any way. Yeah, yeah. They're 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 like two parallel U's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I bet you can make a bridge at some point, right? Like, uh, yeah, because your orbit is a series of messages in order, right. and that's right. in, that's all it is. So in, in the state transition function. You've yeah. got a previous state of your orbit, right? And then, and then messages, and then you process the messages, and you get out a new state and exports. Yeah. Uh, so if you can just build a a uh, orbit uh, client in orbit, which I'm, I'm sure is possible, then you should be able to use like IBC, like inner blockchain communication, to uh, you know even even potentially across different um, Zods. Uh, that that'd be. That'd be an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as I know, right now your Urbit, I mean, I know it does. It has access to the internet natively. It, it's a server. Ah, right. So its its messages can include that, right? So so the reason you would need IBC is for the purpose of validating the state of the uh, remote uh, sender, um, like if they're coming oh, from like a, a different Zod. Uh, like if, okay, are we talking I mean, about I don't, internal network or external network? Um. So if if I, if I we spun up our own Zod and we've got like you know because we were camping and so we've got some state there and we want to send it in and we want uh we want the global orbit Zod or you know we've got a star running and we want it to recognize the authenticity of this other Zod's star sending us a message. Um, so I mean I don't know fully how 
uh, Urbit external messages are uh, validated. I guess you're saying it's, it's just a computer, right? It's not a blockchain. I, I keep on no, applying blockchain just, principles yeah, to it. It's just a computer. So yeah, in that okay. sense, you just have something. So if you receive a, a, a message, um, a packet on port 80 mm -hmm. to your Urbit, it will take right. that through an interpreter and compile it down into something that NOC can understand, which then right. changes the state of your machine. If you leave it open, <laughs> you are in the same, you know, like arbitrary codes coming in, like right. what, or whatever, right? Like it's the same, mm -hmm. it's a computer. And if we're right. going camping, Zod is the router. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Quite literally. Okay, okay. You need a router. Like who's owning, who owns the router, Dan? Who owns the router? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I want to yeah. know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess there's some backbone that we're probably going over. Um, you always need sometimes. That. We, yeah, you need some mechanism, I should say. It doesn't have to be the way Urbit solved that problem, virtually speaking, with this hierarchy. It can be other ways of doing it. And in fact, I would, and even the scarcity thing is people, one of the first critiques they say, well, if this is meant for everybody on the planet, you know, there, right. there's more than 4.2 billion of them. So what yeah. are you going to do about that, right? This is, it's, it is arbitrary. Like, I don't know how else to say, but it's beautiful and it's arbitrariness. It's two to the 32, it's nice, it's, it's like round. But can we go two to the 64? Yes. Like, of course, yeah, because like you said with the comments, you can always add more to you that. You can always add more address space. Uh, I think it would be a good idea for the core developers now to be thinking about, this is my own opinion, by the way, because I do mm -hmm. contract with um, I'll just make sure that's clear now. Oh, I yeah, yeah. Earlier. I, I contract with Talon, so I'm paid by okay. these people. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be a good idea for them to pave the way for additional address space when it is necessary. I mean, literally, Facebook doesn't have this problem right now. It's right. not an issue. It's a non-issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it yeah. could be at some point, and there should be a plan. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for uh, also because yeah, if you contract with them, I know it's like potentially sensitive territory. You know, like I, I'd probably, I'd, yeah, I'd probably be a little uncomfortable if you were like picking apart or like critiquing MetaMask no, very deeply. But no, that's okay. I, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't. Actually, I I take that all day. So <laughs> uh, I mean, I have to hold it at arm's length as a contractor as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm I'm not an employee, but I do take I take compensation, yeah. which is important to say. I probably should have said that up front. Yeah, yeah, that's no, cool. And wherever this goes, um, my guess is to, that these conversations should be and could be sliced and diced based on you know, topic. So yeah, if people yeah. just want to listen to this part, they should. And if they want to listen to some of our other ideas, then they should do that too. Yeah, yeah. OK, so, so yeah, that was, that was very interesting. It was, it was a great intro. Um, yeah, uh, so definitely pass it back to you. Uh, you, got, you got another fun looking topic header here. Uh, Talking um, to Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, so my next topic or my next story is, yeah, it's called Talking to Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and so Malcolm is, a, in my opinion, a fantastic author. He's a very creative individual. He narrates all of his own books, which I think takes a lot of time and effort, and I really respect that. And I think he just comes up with interesting ideas. Uh, so recently he was on the Joe Rogan uh, podcast for like, mm -hmm. you know, as they do for two and a half or three hours. And I haven't gotten through the entire podcast yet, but in the first, you know, part of it, he's talking about his new book, which is called uh, Talking to Strangers. And so my, my story here is about some of the observations that I saw from, or that I'm taking away from this talk. And the fact that I've never actually talked to Malcolm Glad Gladwell makes him a stranger. So it ties right. very well within his latest book, Talking to Strangers, since I've never actually spoken with him. But the, uh, the idea that Malcolm puts forward is that, you know, it, we as humans have been uh, talking to each other for something on, you know, let's call it 60,000, 80,000 years, something like that, right? Since mm -hmm. we invented language or have been living in tribes and we still haven't quite figured out how to talk to each other such that we don't often find miscommunications. Mm -hmm. and, and the book is all about stories of miscommunications, misreadings, all of these things, which lead to some pretty horrible outcomes, um, mostly because people don't know how to deal with each other, or at least the, sometimes it can go quite badly, quite quickly. Uh, and, and I was thinking about, and this is actually similar to what I was thinking about with Urbit, but in more in a computer science perspective. So in mm -hmm. Urbit, the, the core operating system is sealed 
in that there's only one way in and one way out in the predefined, these predefined APIs. And, and I thought, okay, well, it seems like our, our, our society is becoming, you know, as things become more extreme, um, it become my, at least my reaction is to pull back. Like I'm not going into controversy or, or sort of quote, let's call it politics. I, I, I have the opposite. I, I want to like sneak out the back. Like, I, I just don't want to deal with this anymore. And well, what's going to happen to me if I choose to direct my attention someplace other than, you know, large scale issues like um, an impeachment hearing, for example, which mm -hmm. is a common point of cultural understanding. And this is where the frame of where I'm going. So Dan, how, and how can you and I talk to you together if we don't have similar frames of reference, especially if our society is becoming more and more fragmented in such that our, our subcultures are more mm -hmm. meaningful to us than our kind of, let's call them global cultures or macro cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think there's other parallels here for at least for you and me, because we exist within um, some pretty consistent subcultures. This blockchain mm -hmm. subculture is very mm -hmm. consistent. We have our own way of talking. We have our own way of thinking. We have, and we use the internet to coordinate which I think this is just going to become more and more the, the, the norm for more and more people, especially if we build it for them, mm -hmm. right? Well, then what happens when I lose the ability to talk to my neighbor because we are so culturally different or something mm -hmm. like that? And that got me thinking to the idea of if there were such thing as a cultural API, hmm. what, what would that be? And how can mm -hmm. I, how can I, because I think it would be a practice, a, a way of thinking and either like, in, in, when I encounter somebody, like this is the protocol or something like that, mm -hmm. such that I could try to avoid some of the outcomes in which Malcolm talks about in his book, Talking with Strangers, and how I can convey that maybe this is something we should really be thinking about carefully and maybe even implementing because it's likely to become more important as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. I like was literally walking like yesterday and I had a very similar thought, uh, you know, probably cause like you said, we're just stewing in very similar cultures. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was thinking about how, uh, APIs like, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, companies or things they'll, they'll make an API, you know, kind of one at a time and you're, you know, these are your services. And uh, APIs are really the, the digital version of re relationship building. Um, but computers really suck at discovering services. This was kind of the, the, mm -hmm. the th theory that I started coming out with. I was like, it's like the thing that humans consistently stay relevant in, but even though, you know, there's lots of endeavors to like make universal APIs. There's like, oh, we're going to have JSON or PC API, or we're going to have a, a, yeah, a REST 2.0 or it's going to be self documenting with Jekyll and uh, or whatever you call the thing um, and it still doesn't matter because uh, you'll have something that you know oh maybe I want to know weather data and you can be serving weather data all day but if I don't know your endpoint and I don't know how to consume it it's just floating out there in the void and unless I was just this omniscient thing that just hits all the APIs with all the values and consumes all the outputs and then correlates, you know, through some masterful, perfect central uh, associating function, you know, which would require some like globe consuming and unrealistically powerful computer. Um, foregoing that as a likely option, you need basically people to say like, oh, this is a meaningful thing and, and here's what it's meaningful too basically uh, connecting and building relationships between things. And I was thinking about how the, the way that we interact with each other, it, it's not unlike an API, but it's an API that we're constantly designing uh, at, at, on the fly. So when we interact with somebody, you know, we, we decide what, you know, we, what we want to present to them, what, they, what we want them to see of us, and, and expose, you know, potentially services or whatever as we, uh, think think that uh, we're willing to engage in those things. Um, so so yeah, I, I guess you know culture can have a lot of they ha has countless implications. So like the social everything from the social to the like more like uh, organizationally cohesive, you know. And and I think that 
some of the harder problems to solve are things like uh, how do you encourage social bonding when you don't have common frames of reference and i think that's like a totally legit problem um the the problem that i tend to find is more tractable is focusing on the more infrastructural uh relationships so i may not know what your favorite tv show is and i may not be able to refer to it but uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs ain't changing. And so <laughs> when it's time to eat, you know, like, uh, you know, if, if you, if you need help with that, or if you're, you know, uh, like the language of problems and solutions, I think is, is kind of the, I, I think has mm. strong potential to continue to be a kind of universal baseline. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can solve or even report or to suggest that there may be a solution for helping people bond who have no cultural reference points and no language in common, but if they have so much as a way of communicating um, their, their needs and their, and their abilities, then I think that uh, the way that machines and these things that we're building can help is basically helping them cooperate, uh, even without uh, necessarily having cultural uh, points of reference. Just, just that kind of infrastructural base layer, like, can we cooperate despite our differences? Something I wanted to uh, pull apart a little bit more when you were talking about sort of Maslow's hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? So this is almost something that is, I mean, it's maybe not completely object objective, but it's, it's sure. close. Right? Sure, yeah. When I said it, I more meant just the most basic needs. So let's just say like food, air, and water, and we'll take shelter as a maybe, you know, but like there are some things that we all need. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that was that was really what I was trying to drive at. And, and I like that because that's something, but see, when I think you and I are both familiar with Maslow and his hierarchy and probably even that he did not finish that work. And we sort of, um, we, we use what he did start as a really great basis point, but that pyramid is not actually, it actually goes up a little bit further after, I think the last one is self-actualization, right? Right. That's, that's the one everybody always, uh, yeah, right. I didn't know that he was incomplete or that there was anything that could, because how do you go past the tip of a pyramid? Exactly. Uh, clearly, clearly that's If you present it like that, then that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's not, a. I think that's a really interesting way to be thinking about it, um, especially since there's going to be, when I was thinking of this cultural API thing, I was thinking about like my neighbors, which I'm likely going to be speaking the same language for, even if, you know, in, in, a few, in 10 or 15 years, we're more culturally fragmented, even as neighbors, mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll likely still speak the same language or at least be able to understand each other, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. And how would I've you got a pretty diverse it? neighborhood. Right, so how would you deal with it otherwise? Well, mm -hmm. there might be a framework for thinking about things like, um, yeah, needs, and help and things like, I don't need to speak your language in order to see that you're suffering and what can mm -hmm. I do about that and vice versa, right? Like, mm -hmm. so, and, and I don't think this is a particularly new question. I think, you know, civilizations have been dealing with this idea of multiculturalism and multi, multi, you know, everything for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. But we do have some new tools these days. So it's likely yeah. that those tools will be at least uh, put to some use in some framework, right? And if you're mm -hmm. thinking about what tools can I build to help people with these needs, then that's going to have an impact on the things you tend to build, as opposed to mm -hmm. how can I make something to communicate, which might be a um, slightly different set of constraints and, and maybe even miss some things like, uh, like a Google Translate can, can you know, probably get the idea across, but it doesn't do anything else other than that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if we had perfect uh, cultural reference translators, you know, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra or whatever, like, you're still, is, is it going to have the same kick or whatever when you're joking around or whatever? Um, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just recently, like, yeah, knocked on a neighbor's door and learned that this new neighbor, yeah, didn't, we had no language in common. And I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, I'm going to brush up on that one or, or something or we'll, you know. Basically, our interactions are utterly limited in what we mm -hmm. can really, uh, really cooperate around. Um, yeah, but let's maybe push that a little bit further. So let's say you learn a few phrases in, mm -hmm. in this language and you get a chance to practice them out a few times, right? And so now your neighbor knows that you put time and effort into doing that, building a real human connection. And mm -hmm. let's say there's an earthquake, right? And now you yeah. find you're both, you find that you've got an abundance of like, 
kindling and firewood and all that other kind of stuff, but they have extra water. Sure. You know, you could probably that that is going to make that um, interaction a lot easier because you already made that time ahead of time. Plus, the the best thing you can do to prepare for a disaster is know your neighbors. Like that's mm. just like period. Like right. what you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of people just stockpile guns, but it's like yeah. uh, well, if, know you, your if you're friends with your neighbors, uh, you're not gonna be as scared and uh, yeah, you're gonna have yeah. a slightly stronger thing going on uh, around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a challenging. Yeah, I, I wonder like what the rate is because I, I think it's definitely more and more social interaction is going uh, digital. And mm -hmm. uh, I was actually just learning, uh, uh, you know, I, I uh, volunteer um, as an adult leader for uh, my local 4-H club. I was a 4-H kid, mm -hmm. but um, the, the participation rates in 4-H uh, are like declining dramatically. They saw like a 15% drop last year. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, this is like, it's like a really wholesome and wonderful thing for people who build their communities in person. Like, like yes. any, anything a parent can teach, you can have a 4-H uh, sub project about. And, uh, but what I guess we're seeing is we're seeing some trend where kids are getting their sense of belonging and their education and growth or whatever's, whatever they're getting, or maybe they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're getting it somewhere else. Uh, and so we're, we seem to be pretty rapidly like heading towards a place where people are, are not getting their culture uh, locally. Um, right. And uh, so, yeah, so, so maybe, maybe there's a, yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe there's a point in uh, that hierarchy of needs where maybe the things that we get locally are just, they, those need to be the like material. And then maybe, maybe things past that there's, there's like a cultural, this is the self-actualization zone where it's like, well, the kind of video games you like, that you're, particular music whatever i that's internal to you you know it with our phones it's practically a psychic relationship you have with some of the world but it doesn't necessarily affect uh or you know it has yeah. a more tenuous relationship to, mm -hmm. to to these feet on the ground um, and, and i tend to agree uh, and i don't know that it's a good thing or a bad thing honestly i don't mm -hmm. right um but i do see it happening but i yeah. also you know i tend to be of the generation that you know, I'm, uh, I'm not completely like all of my social interactions are not online. It, it's still mm -hmm. a pretty healthy quote mix, whether that mm -hmm. you know, healthy means a mix or not. I, I don't really know. It but feels healthy. Yeah. yeah it feels yeah. healthy. Who knows? Uh, Maybe you'd be healthy with another mix though. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. you'd be healthier. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> but I do find myself wanting to connect more and more online. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I've done some things kind of like what you're doing which is like, where can I spend my time such that I'm forced to go into my community? So mm -hmm. for me, <laughs> that's disaster preparedness, right? Mm -hmm. Like I help coordinate, like I've, I've got a list of supplies that everybody's got around the neighborhood. Oh, and like where cool. the water shut up things are. And we have a mm -hmm. meeting once a year. And then we also have like once a quarter, there's little radio tests to make sure all your radios are still working. But then mm -hmm. that's like, I know my neighbors, like I know their names. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing I do, in, in, in West Seattle where I live, there's a, there's an organization called Time Bank, which, oh, yeah. yeah, which has been around for 40 years. No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like such a long lived thing, but you know what it is it, for me anyway, I have at least some level of technical expertise and I'm offering it to people who have more, let's time than, you know, expertise. So in this mm -hmm. case, I've done it three or four times and, and each time, there was a printer involved. Like I've had fixed somebody's printer. One time there was a laptop battery inside the printer, stopping it from working. And that uh, was the issue. I was like, yeah, it's not going to work now. <laughs> <laughs> that's a heck of a problem to find yourself in. I uh, know. Right. But that's why she couldn't get it to work just because right. nobody in Texas. Like it was, ran. it was in the paper feed or it no. was just shoved inside. It the... was jammed inside the printer head. So like in the back where it, it kind of goes like this, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like so sitting there and then the, the printer head is bumping up against it. I'm like, uh, that doesn't look so right. like maybe slid in while some, maybe it was on a shelf above it or who huh. knows it's inside Weird. the printer. Um, yeah, that's crazy. But there's potlucks every month and now I'm going to mm. go to the next potluck and more likely than not, some of the people that I, that I worked with, we're going to, yeah. you know, not, we're going to share a meal together and then we're going to, um, I was thinking about doing a little presentation on blockchain stuff, right? Ooh. Who knows? We'll see. It'll be fun. 
people love uh, learning about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm always looking for the way to introduce people where they don't feel like I'm pushing something on them because, uh, but there, there's definitely um, curious people. But yeah, uh, yeah. When it's something that you have to buy, it's like, uh, look, I'm not trying to. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that sounds like a really great way to build a connection and and kind of like we were suggesting, like it's it's built around a very like tangible kind of thing, right? It's like mm -hmm. it's like don't if you want to bond with your neighbors, uh, maybe maybe TV shows wrong place to start. Maybe like. Hey, uh, if something ever goes bad, I've got your back. <laughs> like that's now that's that's tangible. Like you just yeah. you just minted a token. That now that's you didn't sell them a token. You just gave them something, right? Yeah. You gave them creation. a promise. Yeah. Body creation. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah keep fun. going, uh, or we're how are you uh, on time? Let me let me check real quick. Um, I think that uh, I've got. I need to get out in the next uh, twenty minutes, but uh, but yeah, I can I can hang out for yeah fifteen okay. or something like that. All right. Um, well, you want to close us out with your your last thing? Sure, sure. I, I was having so much fun with that. Though. Like, uh, yeah, there's a uh, yeah, there's so much to chew on there. Um, I think the way that communities relate to each other is is absolutely uh, critical. Oh heck, my last one. I, I feel like I kind of wedged it into the Urbit talk. Or oh oh, here's here's a fun one. Um, Okay, so I had I had one, and these are these are way less uh, cryptic intros. They're almost just like topic titles. Uh, so, <laughs> so this one is it's a co-invention compensation. Uh, yeah. I, this is a this is a hard nut that I just keep finding mus myself chewing on, and it may not have an answer. Sometimes that's how these things go. You know, it's like just a hard problem that keeps on plaguing our brain. Um, and uh, yeah. I, I, I keep thinking maybe there's a solution in, in you know, organization, uh, creativity. Um, and, you know, I, I think you've done some really admirable things uh, helping nurture some of the maker community. And uh, so anyway, I'll just run it, run it by you. Uh, so co-invention compensation, you know, co-invention, you, you get the concept. It's when two people invent the same thing, basically at the same time. Um, like but, calculus? Yeah, sure. Like calculus or um, uh, evolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure like even antibiotics had like another a co-inventor, but you know, there's, there's like usually somebody yeah. who does it first. They, their name goes in the history books and all. Um, and and you know, I I'm less concerned about uh, the credit uh, in the let's say writing it down terms as much as uh, I feel like there's a lot of room for people who are working on a similar cause to like share. Uh, share velocity or compensation or community support or something. Uh, I, I mean, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I working in, let's say, if, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to make it about what I'm doing, but, you know, like we're, crypto wallets are, are, I think it's a hard problem where there are a lot of ideas of how we can monetize these things. Um, and there end up being a lot of just kind of competing wallets. And maybe that's just how capitalism works. And maybe this is just survival of the fittest. Maybe this is just how evolution itself works. You know, like you got to have a lot of attempts to find a good working thing. Um, but at the same time, I, I got this nagging feeling that like when somebody, let's say somebody comes out with a great new feature, you know, that they can open a pull request to us and we've got a contributing guide that says, if you pull requests to us, you, know, you give up the rights. And we actually, we're MIT open source right now, so we don't really have, many rights ourselves. Uh, so you just end up throwing your ideas into this kind of uh, bucket of, of the greater good or something. But there, it doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, rewarding or adequately compensating people for the contributions they make. Um, and maybe it's less about co-invention. Maybe it's more about like the continuous compensation of iteration. So like, I don't know if you've heard like the stories out of like, the people hold up Toyota as an example of this. Like, mm -hmm. It'll be like they've got such a smooth process. It's like, oh, some guy he came up with the idea. He kept climbing up and down the ladder, but he put a hook on the ladder so he could put his bucket there. He doesn't have to go up and down. He saved uh, you know thirty seconds a day. They did the math. They're like that saved us a million dollars a year, and they split it with him. Right now, that's that's like what I'm talking about. Uh, where, um, but I guess my question is like, are there ways we can do this at a broader scale, like decentralized organizations or or otherwise, like software development, I think is a, is a great question. Like, is there a form of software development we can devise where we invite external contribution that is like commensurately compensated? That's, that's what I seek. Hmm. 
I, I you know, I get, I get the, uh, I have the same, in, like, it's a tough problem, right? Because mm-hmm. like, sometimes the things that are super valuable just don't have much of a financial reward or even mm-hmm. a way to try to sort of rec- recognize them. And, and, and it's sort of the classic example is like raising kids. Like mm-hmm. you don't, you don't get like, uh, you don't get anything for that. In fact, quite the opposite. Mostly. <laughs> but it's really important to society because that's like the next generation of people. So we seem to have this problem, not in just like software development, but like in just sort of just, it's a problem of capital in and of itself. Like it's just can't value everything or mm-hmm. we don't value everything with capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe I'll share some other ex- thoughts that I've, that are maybe close to this. I think mm-hmm. there's a couple ways you might be able to, to work it. Sort of like if you could get um, licensing agreements that were just a bit more intelligent about things, like not just free and open source, but sort of like had that same idea, but also had some automatic compensation built into it. Um, and I, I used to work with a guy um, who who had had this idea. So this is not like my idea. I'm not. So he had this idea to to come up and develop this sort of license. And I thought there was kind of something there to it, right? Like you you can buy those license, and if eventually if it turns out to be worth something, then you know some compensation will flow back to you depending on how much you contributed or something like that. Um, I think that's probably some experimentation with licensing agreements could could be interesting, especially if you could tie them back with smart contracts or wallets for that matter. Mm-hmm. I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, I think there's still going to be a lot of um, traditional enforcement of something like that. I don't know that it's going to be trustless. Not everything needs to be trustless, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Especially, yeah. Yeah. But maybe tying back to also our kind of cultural conversations. Um, I think you and I, coming from a particular culture where currency is far more fluid than for most people, I think you and I are pretty comfortable using tokens as money and Mm -hmm. spending them for goods and services. I do that actually quite a lot with my, the crypto that I own. I don't, I don't like hold it just to hope that it increases in value relative to something else. I, I, you know, like I want to use it. Um, But I also think about (laughs) The, uh, the group of, or the community that has such value lo- or like captured within it, but no way t- in order to um, unlock that. So also this time banking thing that I've been, you know, mm-hmm. helping with, they, they struggle to get the funds that they need in order to, to do basic administration. Mm-hmm. They, have, they have a group of 400 or 500 people adding something like, you know, 80 or 200 hours a week in my neighborhood alone. So wow. The, right. So that's like, there's a lot. That's a really of, active one. I, I think Bay yeah. Area has a time bank. It is, it is not nearly that active. I got on their forum. I, I think there's like 10 a, a month or something uh, right. transactions. Uh, but that's the thing, right? Like you can have these super vibrant networks creating a ton of even economic value in, in terms of sharing and, and helping. And then they're dollar poor or currency mm-hmm. poor, or a way in which to represent that value to another group. Mm-hmm. So I wonder, you know, I think we're just at the beginning of sort of tokens and, and what we might use them for. But likely, if we were to have a group, and we were super tight, like, let's say, you know, all the uh, all the MetaMask OGs, like from back in the day, we already know each other because we did stuff together. And, and that's like our basis of trust. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have things that we're just willing to do for each other for like no money. It's just because we like Mm -hmm. to do things and help each other. So that's our kind of open source compensation. And then if we can kind of pool those representations of those together such that we'd be willing to do things that we don't necessarily want to do for like money, right? To the outside world. Now we can Mm -hmm. monetize some of what our internal group does for the benefit of the group. So this would be like, if I were to do a job that benefits like was paid in dollars, the dollars would go to the group, not to me, but all of the goods and services that I need intergroup. I mean, that's just, we just do that together. And mm-hmm. that's sort of the, that's how our group makes its way in the world is by these pooled. And then you could imagine that this would be, everybody sort of has their own little token that does something like this. And then mm-hmm. it's just like this bartering system across t- um, tokens 
which of course there's no liquidity for any of this stuff. So I don't know if this would even work, but I kind of see mm -hmm. culture and tech and money and gifts, gifting, mm -hmm. um, possibly coming together. I think about what you're talking about might be adjacent. I don't think it's, it's actually yeah. similar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maybe the things that you yeah. with licensing might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think like what you expressed it, it you it really echoes a, a lot of how I tend to think of this stuff. I, I don't think it's uh, the dominant mode in crypto at all. To like I think it's much more common for uh, like I, w I was just on uh, uh, into the ether and and they uh, they had oh no wait sorry I, oh sorry what's the trust of states and uh, you know um, that one is David. POV crypto. POV crypto. Yeah, POV crypto. Sorry. So, yeah, uh, I was subscribe. on POV crypto. Subscribe, everybody. Subscribe. Subscribe. Click and subscribe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was on POV crypto, and they both clearly have a vision of um, their network token because it's like an ether and a Bitcoin yeah. guy. They both see that becoming the like uh, the hub of value transfer. Um, uh, now, I I tend to see a very highly micro economy based thing like like when you talk about going down your street and asking people what they have towards a disaster to me i'm just like those are all tokens like 100 <laughs> percent, and and they may have no liquidity as yeah. in like it may be that like there's no way i care about accessing your neighbor's water right but that's not really the point right that's that's not the point at all the point is it's valuable to you and it's valuable to the other neighbors in your direct vicinity and so maybe the the liquidity of that water <laughs> sorry yeah. uh maybe it's actually just appropriate maybe the liquidity is actually proportional to who it's actually useful to and and so maybe uh yeah building those kind of connecting yeah i don't know if they need to be exchanges or if it's just about uh having it generally accounted for and so that people can see what they have access to uh i don't yeah. know that that all remains to be seen but um yeah. yeah i tend to think that just making those things available is kind of the first step uh, I don't know how that possibly relates to something like uh, licensing or because it almost feels like licensing and organizational dynamics. They almost feel like antiquated things in that context. It's almost like there's an alternative approach where we where we itemize what we need. We're like, yeah, I need some food. I need to keep my shelter. Um, I want some health care. Right. So can we get some doctor tokens? Like we definitely accept donations of doctor tokens. Right. Um, Hell yeah. But uh, <laughs> get a lot of those. Right, right, but like ultimately, we it's it's way less about like oh, I don't know, like residuals of three percent per you know because that that's it's taking this like extractive mentality, uh, and imposing it onto something that ideally is kind of a community resource, and ideally we make it as like kind of fairly and kindly as possible, and we're just taking what we need, and part of our reputation is the fact that we just take what we need and we provide something kind of widely of value otherwise. Um, this is uh, probably why I, I wrestle so much with uh, the ways we could monetize because uh, um, I, I don't want to impose uh, undue friction, especially on new users of stuff. It's like, forget it uh, entirely. Um, in fact, it's kind of like the whole point of this stuff is removing friction. So it's almost like when you come at it with a business perspective, you end up saying, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to remove friction from everything except for what? Uh, and and yeah, so so you can either be criticized for being uncompromising in that, or you know maybe you just have to find the right place to put your friction, your little water mill in the mm -hmm. stream. You know the stream is big enough, but, you know a water mill is going to keep turning. You're not going to stop the the, the rain. Um, so so maybe there's a right path, but maybe there's another one too. Um, Do you have any um, grocery co-ops or food co-ops in your area? Uh, there's like CSAs and stuff, um, yeah. and things like that, and a small grocery store or two. Yeah. So I, when I was doing some work with with one of my neighbors at the Time Bank, she's like, you know, I have all these time credits, but I need groceries. Right. And, and that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Right. And the the grocery curl up needs people to do checking or stocking shelves or cleaning floors or doing taxes or all kinds of other stuff because they rely on their members to do that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times when the members just want to like, you know, shop there as it's right. like a, because this is, I want to support a local co-op, I, mm -hmm. I, but I don't want to like, you know, actually. Well, what if their dues, if their dues were transferable to someone, right? Who right. could redeem them for groceries. Uh, right. Like if you could come up with ways that you could use your time outside of the community and vice versa, 
that like worked. But what you were saying about friction, I think is really important, right? Because we can't just start to make systems and point of sale and all that stuff that might just do this. I think what we have to do, be thinking about is community leaders. So if I wanted to do that, then I would do, I would make sure that that friction was overcome with my community to, to get it to work. Like overcoming the friction in the sense that uh, you have to make sure there's more velocity than you're applying friction or? Uh, well, like let's say, let's say generally speaking, the co-op and the time bank community think this is a good idea to, to do some sort of mutual exchange. Hmm. There's a lot of complexity yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And, and they need somebody yeah. to, to, to like guide them through that. And that's totally what I want to like do with myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if crypto is good for anything, then it needs to be good for people who are already used to running an alternative economy, optimizing their process. Like that's, it's a wonderful use case. Yeah, cooperatives and time banks should be like ground zero. I mean, in the first world, like that's the best candidates. Uh, the third world, you know, in, in countries where there isn't a stable currency, it's much more obvious who's going to use it. It's like yeah. anyone. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but local to us, uh, I think those are great places to experiment. Uh, cool. Yeah, this is uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good catching up with you, Kenny. All right. So just to close it off for anybody who's still yeah. listening. <laughs> so the idea here was that we brought a couple ideas that we wanted to share together. Um, and we shared our stories and we, you know, helped each other understand them a bit deeper. And we're hoping that whoever is listening to this or watching this might feel the the, uh, the urge to do something else. So grab another friend, uh, get on a Zoom call, set up your microphone, have some fun, and then share it out. All right, so that's the idea. And we're calling these, or I'm calling these esoteric thoughts. So thanks, Dan, for joining me on my first recorded esoteric yeah. thought. And mm. uh, yeah, hope to, uh, hope to see you and other people around doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll be fun to see if uh, others uh, follow the uh, Take the Mantle. I hope so. Cool. Oh, take care. Bye.